Chapter 9 lecture will cover geologic time. Studying Earth history is important to the geologists. Rocks record geologic as well as evolutionary changes throughout time. So we need a time perspective. Otherwise, these events have no meaning. A numerical date gives you an actual number in years that has passed since an event occurred. Prior to the discovery of radioactivity, geologists had no reliable method for putting absolute ages on rocks or geologic events. Before radioactivity, rather, relative dates were used to put rocks in sequence. For example, the Hermit Shale is older than the Coconino Sandstone. This tells us nothing about the actual age, but just relative ages. One rock compared to another is older or younger. These relative age dating principles are still used and accurate today. Let me talk about a few relative age dating principles, starting with the principle of superposition. This principle was developed by Nicholas Steno all the way back in 1669. It states that in an undeformed sequence of sedimentary rocks, the oldest rocks are on the bottom and successively younger on top. This can also apply to surface features such as lava flows and ash beds. Here's a sketch of the Grand Canyon. At the bottom we have the Supai group, and then the Hermit Shale, Coconino, and so forth. So the Supai group is older than the Hermit Shale, which is older than the Coconino, which is older than the Toral Weep, which is older than the Kaibab limestone. This is superposition. The rocks on the bottom are older and it gets successively younger as you go up in a sequence of rock layers. The principle of original horizontality states that layers of sediment are usually deposited in flat layers. If the rocks are not flat any longer, then some event caused that to happen after they were deposited. So these sedimentary rocks were not deposited in this folded fashion. They were originally flat lying and stresses, differential stress, created folding of the rock down deep in the earth where the rock behaved in a plastic manner. The principle of lateral continuity states that Sedimentary rock layers are continuous until and extend out in all directions until they thin out or grade into a different sediment or sedimentary rock type. Here are sedimentary rocks in this basin and you can see at the edge it thins out. After some time a river cut through these rock layers and this rock layer is the same as this on either side of the canyon. This is the same as this, and the top yellow layer is the same as the top layer, yellow layer. So we can assume that these were all continuous at one time in the past. It is just that they have been eroded by a river. In this example, we have a fault running up through these rock layers. And if we match the layers, this layer is this layer, it's continuous, it's just been offset by this fault. This layer would match up with this layer here, and so forth. The principle of cross-cutting relationships says that anything that interrupts another rock layer is younger than what it's interrupting or disturbing. For example, these rock layers had to have been present before the fault occurred. How can you fault something that isn't there? So we say the fault is younger than the rocks that it is disturbing. Another example of cross-cutting, we have igneous dikes running through this rock layer. The dikes are younger 
than the rock, how can a dike cut across something that isn't there yet? So these must be older. The dikes are younger and are disturbing the, pre, the existing rock. The principle of inclusions. An inclusion is a piece of a rock that is enclosed in another rock unit. The rock containing the inclusion is always younger. That means the piece, the inclusion itself, is older. Let's take a look at this. Here we have an igneous intrusion, and when it came and intruded this metamorphic rock shown in green, it drug in pieces of that metamorphic rock. And we call these xenoliths, but they have been included in the igneous intrusion. So the inclusions are always older than what they are sitting in. Here we have an example of sedimentary rock layers that have been deposited on top of this igneous intrusion. Once again, these inclusions are older than what they're sitting in. Same here. These inclusions are older than the sedimentary rock layers. How can they be included up into these layers if they weren't there to begin with? We use the term conformable layers to describe layers of, of rock that have been deposited without interruption. That means without erosion and without a time where there was no deposition. Many times, however, there is a break in the deposition of sediment or sedimentary rock layers. We call that an unconformity. And it represents a time where sediment was either not being deposited or erosion was occurring. We're going to identify three types of unconformities, angular, non, and disconformities. These unconformities can be quite large and encompass a large portion of a continent. How do they form? An ocean comes in. During an ocean covering a continent, there is a lot of deposition of sediment which turns into sedimentary rock layers as shown in this first picture. When the ocean retreats, or regresses is the term, and in this case they're showing the land has been uplifted. Uplifted land is going to be eroded away. That is your unconformity. That's your missing time. The rock layers have been removed. Then the ocean comes back in, and during that time more sediment is deposited and turns into sedimentary rock. So this little squiggly black line here is showing what we call an angular unconformity. Summarizing, unconformities form when oceans invade continents, deposit sediment, then they leave the continents where now the continent is exposed to the elements and they erode. And that erosional surface is the unconformity. This is a very famous unconformity. In fact, it's an angular unconformity drawn here at Sikar Point off the coast of Scotland. And we can see that the rocks below the unconformity are vertical. They weren't deposited in that fashion. They were deposited in flat layers, and tectonics created them a situation where they tilted upright. Then additional sediment was deposited on top of the unconformity, where you have gently dipping beds of a sandstone and then a conglomerate. This famous unconformity was first described by James Hutton uh, and he realized that this sequence of rocks represented a vast amount of time. I'm going to stop the video here. We'll go into details on the three types of unconformities in our next video.